Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cooper Hopkins with Film Independent, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been on Zooms like this before. And for anyone who's uh, on for the first time, I'm here to welcome you to the virtual edition of our year-round screening series, Film Independent Presents. Um, we certainly have some very, very special guests who I um, have no doubt you see on your screen right now. Um, so I will get out of the way in just a moment uh, to let them have a fabulous conversation about the new documentary feature, Belushi. Uh, but before we get into that, let me just thank uh, some of our sponsors who helped the program stay up and running. Uh, first, I wanna thank uh, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. They've been on board with uh, Film Independent Presents and a number of our other programs for many years. So um, big thanks to them. Uh, wanna thank our screening partners, Vision Media and Kilburn Live. Uh, they help out with our online screenings and also our drive-in screenings. Um, and yes, that's true. We have drive-in screenings. One is coming up very soon. So check out filmindependent.org slash presents, uh, excuse me, events. Well, you can go to presents too. Um, around the website so you can see my handiwork. Uh, either way, we have lots of stuff coming up, so please check that out. Um, and then I wanna thank our uh, media partner, the Los Angeles Times. And now, without too much further ado, he's been a very, very busy man. I know he just had a, a, a Q and A that he moderated with a couple of friends of ours, uh, Mike Covino and Kyle Marvin, the directors of The Climb, which was uh, nominated for a Spirit Award last year. Um, he is, uh, he's, uh, he's Judd Apatow. And he's here to, to moderate this conversation uh, with RJ Cutler and uh, Judy Belushi. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce those folks and let them have a great conversation. And the last thing I will say is remember that Belushi premieres on Showtime, November 22nd. If you haven't seen it already, please do so. Judd, take it away. Uh, happy to, to take it away. Uh, hello, Judy, RJ. Hello. How nice are you? To great you. great nice to, to see you. Great to talk to you. It's... Uh, uh, you know, it's a, an amazing documentary, uh, one that, you know, we needed, I think. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, people knew that much personally about John Belushi uh, and, and his journey. And as a diehard fan, there was so much that I, I didn't know about and so many wonderful details. Uh, it, it really, you know, brought him to life. And I, I do feel like what we're learning with a lot of these documentaries, Entries is it really creates like the history for certain people and artists and it becomes the way in for people to explore their their body of work that people will see a movie like this and then say oh I'm gonna I'm gonna do the deep dive now and I'm gonna watch all the movies and hunt down all the old sketches uh, and it seems like they're essential that that these types of uh, pieces exist Judy what did you think didn't exist out there about John that made it important that something like this was made? Well, I, I didn't feel there's actually a documentary that truly captured his essence. Yeah. Um, I think because of the 1982 drug death, it really overshadowed his life. And that repercussion went on for years, given the circumstances that kept kind of popping up to reshuffle that information. And I feel like while uh, RJ's look at John isn't particularly different in terms of the facts. He understood who John was. He understood his 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 spirit, and I think that's what was lacking. And and you said, I think you said something along the lines of you felt like you spent time with John after watching the doc, and that's I, something I had hoped it would also accomplish, which I also think it does. And and when you watch something like this for the first time. Uh, is, is it a, a difficult first watch? At, at what stage are you led in to see a cut <laughs> yeah. and, get, and give notes? And what is that experience like for yeah, you? Yeah, it's difficult. It is difficult. I, I, you know, I immediately, I, I mean, I think I n never thought it wasn't a good documentary, but I would have liked to have done another edit of my own. Can't say yeah. it would have been better, but it would, <laughs> but it would have made yeah. me happier. Yeah, yeah, and not uh, you know it's it probably isn't the kind of things you'd think I'd want to cut. It's it's I mean I have some really stupid little nuanced things that bother you know that I can only see one way, yeah. um, but um, just this uh, you know I just would rather not go there and say I I just think that the documentary they produced is is really good. I it really captures John. It's uh, his his uniqueness, his talent, his drive, his you know his vision, his bringing, the way he brought people together, the way he was a leader. Um, 
his work stands out within the context of his personal life as well. And I, and I think it's a very interesting viewpoint. I'm really happy yeah. that they, they did it. Well, I, you know, I know uh, RJ from working uh, on the Gary Shandling documentary. Uh, right. It's, it, it's so hard to try to bring someone's essence alive. And when you have all this material, <laughs> those selections skew their identity. Mm. Yeah. There were certain interviews in the Gary Shandling documentary yeah. where I thought, if I use this sentence, it changes everything about you, what you would think about this period sure. of your life. And if I remove it, it completely shifts your sense of what it was <laughs> yeah. uh, in that year. And certain people, I could make them look crazy or Anybody. I could make them look wise. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sure. and there's so much power that the director of a documentary has to to do that. What were the challenges telling a story like this? Also, um, something you know from many decades ago, yeah. uh, you know, to find a way to to have it be accurate and to capture uh, you know the vibe of those times. Uh, yeah, what uh, great questions. And you're right; it's it is as you know from uh, the Shandling documentary is just a, a fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations on that. But as you know, it's it's alchemy. One drop, one drop too much, one drop too little changes everything. And and so uh, so it is all about finding the right balance, the right proportions. In the case of John, who the the though he lived a, a relatively short life, so much work was was achieved. Finding the right balance between all of that was one of the challenges. And for me, the first challenge was the fact that. Um, that it had been many decades. And as I first started to kind of chat with people, not even in interview environments, but just uh, in conversation, folks who uh, had known John, uh, I, I, I found myself, uh, I, I felt like the conversations were a little bit lost in the foggy haze of memory. They mm -hmm. were, uh, uh, they, there was a, not an immediacy. People were telling me the stories they tell when they tell stories about John and mm -hmm. there was a great distance. And I knew that was not gonna work for us. I, 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 I felt very strongly that the, the, the people talking about John had to be doing so in a way that was raw and immediate and present and Belushi. And, um, and so that was, the, that was the first kind of you know, riddle that had to be solved. And of course it, it was addressed when Judy invited us up to the vineyard and we spent some time together. And one of the things she encouraged us to do was dig through John's archive, which she made available to us. And it was there that I found, uh, we found these audio tapes that, um, that, that, that she and Tanner Colby and, and had, uh, conducted to put together the oral history that became the book Belushi, but there were all these tapes, 60, 70 hours of audio tapes that, um, that, that got to the essence and were the people who knew John best and, and shared their lives with him. So, so that was one of the big challenges. Of course, the other is that John was a private man and, uh, and he, he uh, you know, the, I, I was struck the other day when I realized that uh, People Magazine launched in 1974. Uh, Saturday Night Live launched in 1975. Ours was not a culture of every celebrity shares everything. In fact, quite the opposite. It was a culture where celebrities felt their, pri their private lives belonged to them. And John certainly felt that. And he, um, he, he bristled, as you see in the film, when, when journalists wanted to dig into his private life. Um, but of course, he was not private with with uh, with with Judy. He was he was deeply personal. And another thing that we discovered in the archive were these beautiful, beautiful letters that uh, he wrote to Judy and that she had preserved. And again, she so generously uh, gave us uh, permission to use. So those were among the riddles and uh, and among the solutions we found. Uh, and Judy. What does it feel like, uh, you know, uh, all this time later to, you know, make yourself so vulnerable and to open your heart to people and share, you know, you know, such an intimate part of your life, such an important part with people? Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's fun to get a sense of the joy 
of your relationship and, and all the adventures that, that people talk about. And it's heartbreaking, uh, you know, to see that struggle, uh, you know, with addiction, which unfortunately all of us have, have friends and, and friends that we've lost. And it feels so familiar, the stages of it. Yeah. Are, yeah. Were you reluctant to go that deep into doing this again? Uh, you know, from the time John died, everything was sort of opened up, but it wasn't even real. And, you know, I guess I could have just walked away from that and not cared, but, uh, you know, I did care. And, um, I started those interviews and many of them are on video actually, uh, the year after he died. And I did some in New York and Chicago and LA and, uh, had, in, had hoped to do a documentary of my own. But over the years, really uh, couldn't find anyone who ever wanted to let me do it. They always wanted a, a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, I finally, uh, in 2005, decided I wasn't ever going to do anything and that I would like to take the interviews and put them in a book form. And I did do a book called Belushi. And that's when I met Tanner Colby. And um, actually, I was kind of thinking of something that would be pretty simple to put together. Yeah. Um, and he looked at what we had and said, this is really good. And we, and, and you, you should finish it. I never finished the interviews that there were people I hadn't interviewed. So, so he encouraged me to do that. And I said, it's the last thing I want to do, but you're right. We'll do it. And, uh, you know, so we went and finished that book up and it, it, you know, it's just, I, but from, um, you know, wanting to share it with, from when I first lost John and the, the sense of, of the, uh, the emotional toll it took. Uh, was such that I really wanted to write about it as a writer and um, explore it. And I at first wasn't sure that it wasn't just cathartic, but I felt when it was all said and done that I tried to track the, em the emotional growth from the, the grieving and the anger and the mourning yeah. into the light. Um, and I you know, ultimately felt that it did track that pretty interestingly. So I, I, I followed through with that. And once I've done that, I'm sort of, everything's out there anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, when you watch the documentary and you hear different people talk about him, and there does seem to be like a Rashomon type of look at him, where I would assume that some people's relationships with John were very different than other people. I'm sure he had yeah, you know, he, comedy <laughs> friends and party friends and intimates and you know, people from his family. And, uh, uh, but who, when they talk about John, did you feel captured his essence the best in the documentary when you heard them speak and you thought, wow, that, well, that captures that. Yeah. Well, I, sorry, I, I haven't seen it for a while, but the Danny's always so well-spoken. I mean, mm -hmm. just as well-spoken about anything. And certainly when he's passionate, like he is with John, he, he, he always comes through. Um, I think Mitch Glazer has a real insight and I don't remember specifically what he would have said in the documentary, but uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, it's just interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, cause it did, it did feel like some people really had thought very deeply about him and his art and his issues. Um, it seemed like, um, you know, uh, there were some people that, you know, had kind of a, RJ, like what, who, when you listened through, who were you taken by that had thought deeply about this and had opinions? Because in a way, I, you know, it's something that it's hard for us to understand. He is, it's still always an enigma of a, of a person. His personality traits um, are, you know, somewhat elusive in a way because he's mm. so charismatic and he's so mm. funny and he's he's also has such a kind of a wild energy that mm. it's hard to really understand how to describe what that is and i know from my friends and my friends from comedy sometimes you have a feel like oh there's a certain type of white hot presence mm. that is living in a different reality than everybody else and yeah. RJ, who when they talked about it were you like who is your go-to person when you would get in trouble, I could describe some of that. Well, uh, 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 you know, it's a great it's a great chorus. These voices, as you know, and and of course, Carrie Fisher speaking about addiction b b becomes in a, a way a centerpiece of the film because she had she had insights into that from her personal experience and from her conversations with John. But really, uh, you know, I, I always felt that Harold Ramis kind of had 
his arm around John's spirit and that he, uh, uh, he speaks at various points of the film with a, a kind of wisdom, a sense of, of, of um, all of the things to be excited about and all of the things that perhaps uh, you get the feeling uh, frightened him a little. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you had this sense that from when he knew John, he had the, the greatest admiration and deepest attraction to him as, as, a, <coughs> as a colleague, as a fellow artist, as a fellow performer. Um, and of course they would remain friends uh, uh, throughout his life, but, but, um, but uh, as well um, a sense of, uh, some sense of foreboding. And you hear that in the film and, and, um, and in a way he, that he provides both of those voices throughout. Um, yeah. and, and so I'd say Harold. What year, uh, Judy, did you do the interview with Harold? Uh, that actually wasn't one of mine. Because it was sounds it? later, the, the, the yeah, Harold I'm interview. I'm pretty sure it was some other interview. Uh, I don't think I got to Harold. Yeah. And, and I should say, by the way, it, 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 it should be said, Judy and I sat for several interviews over the two and a half years or so. The only contemporary interview I did in making the film or interviews was with Judy. And she, you know, there were days that, I, 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 Judy, I hope you don't mind my saying that were easier than others, days yeah. that were harder than others, days that the memories flowed more fully, days that it was better to end the day early and go get some uh, Italian food in Burbank. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, but it was an incredibly rich part of the process. And that's, that's the, the heart and soul of the film in terms of people, uh, those who speak of John. Yeah. Because uh, with, with the Ramus interview, it sounded, uh, I thought it sounded like, you know, it, it was done not that long before he got very yes, ill. Yes. Um, I, do you remember where you got it, RJ? Uh, um, I'm pretty nope. sure it was. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Judd. I, I remember seeing it somewhere. Yeah. Um, but it was. it's always great to hear Harold. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I got the chance to work with him and he was a very you know, special person and talked about John often. And one of the things we enjoyed about making a movie with Harold <laughs> is his willingness to share stories. Mm. And he yes. really had such affection for that time and like to tell you about it and, and make it come to life. How, you know, yeah. I, I think my whole career has been like some sort of, you know, attempt to kind of build a world that reflected how much I wanted to be a part of that world that you were in. <laughs> Uh, you know, white, there's all these friends and they're from Canada and Chicago and New York and they're the funniest people on earth and they love to hang out and they're all geniuses and uh, <laughs> even seeing all the pictures in the, in, the, in the documentary, you're like, just seeing everyone like just, you know, yeah, on someone's cool. apartment, you can't believe yeah. who's there. What yeah, did it when feel people like, used to just drop by, right? You know. And what did it feel like at the time? It was an awareness that a very special moment was happening, it, yeah. you know, starting even with the, the Lampoon days in Second yeah. City, did, did you know, like, I think these people are like the best people ever. Did it feel like 1960s pop music in, in England or was everyone just working and trying to get by? No, you know, it was, it was really great. It was, I mean, Second City, I feel like was sort of, you know, a college environment of sorts. It, it's kind of like the Harvard of improv. And so John was very uh, serious on one hand toward his work. They worked a lot uh, and a lot of the day was in prep for that work. But then at, at night, you know, like I would go over and watch their improvs and then we'd do something. It wasn't very, usually we just went like to either someone else's, usually Brian Murray's apartment or yeah. people would come to ours. The guys would watch movies and call like Joe Flaherty if he wasn't with us and, you know, and they'd, get on this movie and they'd all watch the movie. And then the next night they would do improvs about that movie. Yeah. Uh, was, you know, there's a lot of fun, a lot of laughter. Um, and then, you know, as we got to New York, I, I, yeah, I always thought everybody was really good. I thought it was, it, whatever level we were at, like when we were in Chicago and you know, John was 21, or I think when he got into second city, 20, yeah, pretty sure. Um, we were young and, and you know, and yeah. it was a decent salary. <laughs> it was like, yeah. It's you so know, young. Apartments. I mean, that's it's really crazy young to be, you know, main stage second city in Chicago, yeah. uh, feeling all that uh, uh, approval. That those years at Second City, um, when that he was, was on stage all the yeah. time, 
did uh, do you do you feel like well some of that was the best best stuff ever that no one else will ever see? I like, do feel that. Was that the, yeah. the highlight in a way of the career? Was the the, the immediacy of, the, of those times? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, there's something about live theater. If you like it, you you get it. it the energy yeah. is there, and it's it's and it is so in the moment. It it's it's infectious. It's fun, um, and and it's such a good learning environment there. Uh, even just to watch, uh, I feel like that really helped me as a writer. You know, learn scene structure and what's funny and why a joke might work one day and not the next, and you know those yeah. kind of things. Um, and that was a real caring community. It was a very family community. I mean, John learned, you know, very much how to uh, work together at that point. And I think Harold said he he learned to make a scene work as opposed to steal the scene or put mm -hmm. it in a different way. But that was the right. idea. And I thought, yeah, because at first he just was, you know, used to just get a laugh, get a laugh, yeah, which he could do. And uh, there he learned to reel it in and share and make sure everybody looks good. And, although he was always generous that way. But yeah, he, but it was funny to see those clips because, you know, we all know it from when we go to those improv shows. There's yeah. always the one person that your eye goes to and you go, that's, that's the star of this show. And every once in a while, you're like, well, that's the funniest person I've ever seen. I can't believe. I remember seeing Bonnie Hunt in Second City when yeah. they had one in Los Angeles. And right. my friend were like, She's like the funniest person I've ever seen. And that there are those people that just explode uh, on stage in that way. Yeah. RJ, what, I saw what I, Chris Farley was, was, yeah. you know, was one of those guys too at Second City. Yeah, certainly Chris Farley, you know, when we knew Chris when he was young, you, you know, you always felt that connection to Belushi yeah. because he, he was one of those guys that would just, if he just looked you in the eye, you would start laughing like there was just well, some physical his yeah. the, the, the way he denied his size with his physicality you know yes yes similar and uh and rj you know what was really interesting was how much of this the of this was influenced by the 60s and the politics of the time uh the satire of the time i don't know if i've ever really felt the context for all that work in saturday night live Till I saw this documentary, how much it, it forms everyone's attitude about the work. Yeah, well, it, it emerges from the 60s, the, the, the politics, the culture, the irreverence, the, the groundbreaking. There's a direct line from the National Lampoon, of course, to the Lampoon Radio Hour to Saturday Night Live. It's kind of, there, there are other elements in each one, but in some important way, it's all the same gang. And it's that it's it's uh, it's it's uh, thumbing your no more than thumbing your nose at authority. It's putting a pile of dynamite under it and blowing it up. And that's what happened to all of us. Those of us, I'm sh I'm sure you you know the, the, the kids on Long Island subscribing to National Lampoon magazine yeah. when they were teenagers were yeah. were the same ones who then found the Radio Hour and the same ones who joined the whole country when Saturday Night Live launched and we, uh, our minds were blown. We had never seen anybody do any of those things. We had never seen anything like that opening the immigrant sketch. We had never seen anybody who would, who would make fun of, of our news anchor and, and uh, suggest that, that, uh, that there was pomposity there. That was, you know, the, the, the juxtaposition of that with what we all were raised on was so uh, it was it was anarchic and and John Im embodied that spirit in every way in every way yeah. and so uh, there you couldn't deny the connection and then when you hear he's uh, ten feet away from the from the the sixty eight Chicago convention riots when they break out you realize you know he's he's woven into the fabric of everything we understand about that period. Uh, Judy, what do you remember front, about the front line kind of guy? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you were there uh, at the Democratic convention when that happened. And, and what do you remember about that, that moment and also just, uh, you know, your time at protests and the political... Uh, well, I have to uh, say that was a, a mismemory by Tino. Tino was our friend who was in an improv group with John at yeah. that era. And I was still in high school. Mm -hmm. um, he, and when he asked me if I wanted to go, I said, are you crazy? You think my parents would let me go? <laughs> <laughs> I was still in that mode. Yeah. And um, so he went, but he, you know, I mean, I, he, he was marching and they, they I believe Dick Gregory said, we're not protest, you know, we're not 
an illegal assembly. We're all just going to my house. Yeah. And they started moving forward. And then the tear gas was blown out and all that. And he got hit, uh, not directly by a tear gas, but he got a big dose. Uh, and he made his way to my, my brother lived in the city at that point. So he went to my brother's <laughs> and rang the bell, you know, at 10 o'clock. Like, it's John. And my brother said he looked out, you know, when you used to drop your keys down and stuff, he looked out and he could smell him. Yeah. And he said, what <laughs> happened to you? So that was tear gas. He's oh man. So he, so he had to take, he took his clothes off outside, they, you know, <laughs> trashed them. Uh, it was just really bad, actually. Yeah. But, um, and and, but yeah, and how was, about you had to be, you know, dedicated and um, a believer to take part in those things. I, I did some, I was, when I went to the University of Illinois later, I was in those 1974 protests. And, yeah. Well, I was going to say it's it's a it's a it's a mere six years between the '68 convention, of course, and and Watergate, and the footage of the yeah. the, the, the Watergate satire footage is in the film is unbelievable and and oh. hilarious and so raw and is the same you know you you recognize Saturday Night Live, what would then become Saturday Night Live in the footage that you see during the Watergate era that the that the the Lemmings folks were doing. And the, and the yeah. Lemming show also with the the parody yeah. of Woodstock, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I love the idea that they were the you know making fun of themselves, you know <laughs> satirizing the protesters and the bands. What was yeah. that moment in New York like for them suddenly to be? Was that a Broadway show or an off Broadway show? Off Broadway, off Broadway, the Village Gate in the basement. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know those poles you get the wrong seat. Yeah, yeah. but um, you know, back to what you had said about a lot of his best work being sort of just in the universe. Um, likewise, he was very political and satirical, you know, most of his work, so much of his work up until Saturday Night Live. Um, from mm. the time he actually got into the bigger world, he kind of that, you know, they did some of that, but they, they mostly sidestepped and were just doing entertainment humor and yeah, it's uh, kind of a loss. Because he had, I, I do, this, if people often say, do you miss something? I do miss his interpretation on politics, especially yeah. like at this time, it's, yeah. it was very astute. <laughs> because there's a moment where you're like, you're young and you're funny and you're trying to be famous, but in a way you're still trying to change the world through yeah. your work and, and your yeah. art. And then suddenly mm -hmm. you're very famous and it becomes more entertainment than it becomes politics. But and he still I, turned down that potato chip commercial. Exactly. <laughs> See, no one turns those down anymore. Every the last person no. who would have turned it down. I know, and I'm thinking, why didn't we it. turn that down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have got that potato chip. I turned down, I turned down a, 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 when the Blues Brothers came out, there was a company that made little album covers of gum. And I said, yeah. could you do a sugarless gum? Yeah. <laughs> and they said no. And I said, well, Okay. Yeah. I really want that little album cover. I don't yeah. have it because yeah. they didn't do sure list come. <laughs> and was it, uh, you know, as you were, um, you know, witnessing these changes in uh, his attitude towards the work, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I've witnessed people go from being, you know, popular to the whole thing exploding to another level. And do you, you know, do you look at that now and, and think, oh, we were so young? Because that's how I always think about it when I see my friends. And, you know, you'll see a lot of people, they get very famous and suddenly they just make like five movies in a year. And I see everyone make the same mistake, which is they accept all the work and they can't stop themselves from right. getting intoxicated yeah. by fame or opportunity. And what was it like in that era for those people yeah. to suddenly uh, have that? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, the Blues Brothers, I mean, Animal House exploded, but Blues Brothers really exploded because it was music and film. And um, and I'd say that, yeah, that was the, when, uh, when John turned 30 and Blues Brothers was, the re record was just out went to number one. And so was Animal House and so was Saturday Night Live and that trifecta. Um, that was a very heady time. Yeah, it kind of takes another level I think you gotta re re, re uh, assess who you are and come back to earth yeah and do you RJ like when when you were assembling that you know it seems like there's you know there's multiple issues happening at the same time one is addiction and another is just uh the the pressure to deliver and 
getting lost in the expectations for your work? Uh, and, and how did you try to you know, get across just emotionally what it's like to be at the center of, of something like that? Because when I look at people that have, um, you know, that we've lost in those moments or as a result of those moments, you know, you always feel like you, 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 know, you want to like say to Kurt Cobain or somebody, oh, it wasn't that important. We were just putting out records and we loved them, and but but it feels so important in the moment. Yeah, well, you you one couldn't help but feel uh, um, that if if there had been a way to take a break, you know, something did a sense of of that life is long, um, you know, that yeah. would, that would have been the thing you wanted to you wanted to cry out to him. But for us and. The, 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 the way we um, conveyed the intensity of the period, oddly enough, was, was by anchoring the animation in the little boy, John. Mm. And that was, that was kind of the, you know, a big piece of the puzzle to me was when, uh, you know, the, the, if people who've seen it know, Robert Valley's animation, does a lot of the storytelling when we didn't have footage, but it also is present throughout the film. And it's and he did a beautiful job. And but but periodically, it's it's young John, the the the, the same little boy who yeah. goes around the neighborhood knocking on the neighbors' doors and performing in their living rooms, and is is present. And and for me, I was always trying to bring it back to the essence of who he was even amidst all the madness. And, uh, and, and so that's what, because you, you're, just, you're just trying to get to the person, trying to get to the person. And what was it like for the human being to be in this, in this uh, you know, on some level inhuman, <laughs> but wonderful and intoxicating, as you say, and attractive, but, you know, but terrifying place. And, uh, and Robert's work really helped with that. You know, I wanted to say, I, I like that, the little boy coming out of the man uh, a lot I, in that I also think um, I've often said, I mean, John, I think part of what made him his humor was he had a very childlike way of seeing things. He could mm. reduce himself to seeing things fresh the way a child does. And um, so there's lots of implications to that image, but that was one that I heart. That yeah, I, I mean, the, the first time Robert, when I, the first time I saw the little boy image was, was was the knocking on the door scene in the film. And as soon as I saw that, I said to Robert, we're gonna, he's gonna be there the whole film. And it, and in fact, it's one of the very last images we see of John is that little boy. And uh, I think there's a, a larger truth to that, of course, but, um, but it was, it, it meant a lot specifically to who he was. Um, we have some questions from people who are uh, yeah. out there. <laughs> Uh, uh, Jim Buchholz, uh, he asked um, uh, about, about uh, Ghostbusters that Dan Aykroyd mentioned that he was writing it and writing uh, it for him and, and John, and he asked if you know which part he was supposed to play. Uh, Bill, Bill Murray replaced, it was Beckman. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so Bill, Bill took over that role. Mm -hmm. And uh, William McCuddy asked, over the years when you've watched later casts on Saturday Night Live, um, who is there anyone that you were taken with or who felt you know comes closest to John in, in style or energy? I think a lot of the actors over the years have reminded me of them. I mean, someone like Will Farrell who doesn't look like John, or yeah, you know, I, I feel he's got that he's from that school, he's got the same, yeah. you know, he, he has this sense of humor and dedication <laughs> he's yeah, all yeah. out with whatever he does you know yeah <laughs> and, and many a lot of every cast i think is you know well chris farley we mentioned obviously yeah and and talk about what your your like work uh, that you were doing because you were doing like books and graphic design and in that period at, at saturday night live and i remember the saturday night live script book uh the scrapbook and what were the projects that you were working on in that in that era uh i I worked with uh, Ann Beats who, who did the script book and I helped on it at one point. It was her, she was the editor. Um, uh, and we did a book called Titters, which was a collection of humor by women. <clears throat> the first one and the second was a, a, a parody of literature 
textbook. Mm -hmm. Very, very exciting. <laughs> and um, uh, I did a book. I did a lot of compendium books. I did an Animal House a book that went mm -hmm. along with that, which I designed. Yeah. I wrote and designed a book to go with Blues Brothers called Blues Brothers Private. Mm -hmm. um, mostly I was doing work that I could control. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So since I couldn't control much else in my life, um, <laughs> so that I could, you know, travel with John and work remotely. And, you know, of course, I sometimes had to go be with people and do things. But uh, that was sort of what steered my work. We had a production company called Phantom. And, uh, you know, like once we got into Blues Brothers, I was helping produce everything that happened around those. I designed the, <clears throat> the album covers mm -hmm. um, and um, just all sorts of writing and or design work. And when you look back at, at, at your experience of it, I think, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to know exactly what was joyful and what was terrifying about it. But what was, when you look at those years, and I guess it's, you know, it's about like 14 years or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. how do you describe your experience of that time? Well, what remains with me really is a, a lightness of spirit, a lot of fun uh, when it was um, quiet, a very comfortable, uh, relaxing time was had a di whole, totally different energy. Um, you know, yeah, there were difficulties, a lot of difficulties. Uh, dealing with an addict is difficult. And, um, but as I say, mostly I, I think back and it's pretty positive stuff. Yeah. And when I mean, you... John taught me so much as well. I mean, he, he radicalized me <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a, a teen, early adult, young adult. Um, uh, you know, took me places I never thought I'd see. Yeah. We, we really moved quickly. It, it just, yeah, I learned to move very quickly. Yeah. He, he, he would say something like, we're going to the clubs in 10 minutes. Or, <laughs> you know, we, we'd, we'd have been like watching television minutes ago in our pajamas. But uh, you know, just had to learn to move quickly. Uh, but I, um, yeah, so I learned to move quickly. I learned to be much more confident. Um, I learned a lot about business from him. He was very much, you know, do it right, do, do things right away. Don't put it off and all that. I'm much better than I am about that. But he helped at least me recognize that's the way you should do it. Um, so I don't know. So it's a, a good, the good memories. And, and RJ, I, I uh, uh, when you, uh, you know, were looking for interviews uh, with John, uh, like searches like, you know, at a time when everyone wasn't doing podcasts and there weren't many times where they sat down in a very open, honest way and discussed their experiences. Uh, it, it seems like you got a lot done with limited supply of long form interviews. Were those like Rolling Stone interviews where someone kept the tapes or what, what were you working with there? Well, uh, genuinely, the the, the uh, uh, Judy's oral history project would provided uh, the the, uh, uh, the vast majority, and then we were filling in gaps. We and what we I, I, I'm I'm very fortunate in that uh, the researchers I work with, uh, uh, Ryan Gallagher and Austin Wilkins, are just to kind of, you know, I don't know how they do it, but they they do a rain dance and material things show up in people's garages and uh, and they know how to track them down and we got very fortunate. But the the, the treasure trove was the material we found uh, in the oral histories and, um, and we were able to build the film around that. And then of course, you know, Bill Hader reads yeah. John's letters in this film and, and, and does so, so brilliantly without, without performing John, but nevertheless capturing his, uh, his essence. And his heart and soul, and um, and th and that everything just had to add up. And and um, I mean, even the graphic design. There's a density to the film, uh, very intentionally. There's a there's a a, a, a density that's also an intensity. And yeah. uh, and and Stefan Nadelman's work there, making the graphic. You know the. You don't just see a photograph, you, you know, you yeah. see eight at a time and you somehow get them all at once. And that was very John. So we, we, we had to be conscious of how do you get the, how do you capture the man with relatively limited uh, um, original material. And tell me about your, um, 
collaboration with Joe Beshenkovsky, the editor who worked with me on the Gary Shandling documentary. Brilliantly, yeah. Really. Uh, Beautiful editing. Re remarkable work uh, with me and, uh, but also was very strong about uh, certain philosophies. I remember he said to me, let's never use an interview with Gary when he's older than when the period is we're talking about. So if we're going in order, I don't want to ever hear old Gary talk about young Gary. And I was uh, so mad at him. I was like, wait, <laughs> but that, I, that takes away everything. He's like, no, it'll add up and it'll be better. Um, but uh, how do you work with, you know, with your editor and with, with Joe on constructing a story where, you know, to take someone's life and put it in an hour and 47 minutes is somewhat of a nightmare. I needed four and a half hours because I gave up on it but you really <laughs> pulled it off you know when I watched it I'm like wow I really had no discipline to figure out how to do this uh in a tighter uh more focused way uh how, uh, well, how do you approach that with Joe well Joe is um as you know is a, is a maestro and uh and he has a, um a, a strong opinions and vision and that's very exciting to me and he, it was, uh, it was he who encouraged the density from the beginning. Uh, and it was he who encouraged the, we early on decided that, that we would build, the earliest cuts were built around musical pieces. Mm -hmm. And one of the things uh, I, I reached out to Judy early on to ask was music that John loved. What was, what was the music that he listened to throughout his life and from childhood on? And she gave us a list and we built the first cuts, which were long, around, around these musical pieces. And that became very um, instructive as to what the film wanted to be. The, a big uh, uh, key to the success though, was that we were stuck long for quite some time and we needed to take a break so that the animation could get done. Yeah. And well, fortunately, this was not a film that had to be done for Sundance on a schedule or, you know, we weren't, sometimes you're, you got to get to that December finish. I'm in the middle of it as we speak. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, but in this case, we could take the time and God bless John Batsik, who, who, who was my producing partner, who, you know, he, some days he wished we hadn't, but, um, but he, he let, he, he supported us in taking that time and getting from two hours and 15, 20 minutes to an hour 47 became much clearer on the other side of that break because we had perspective. It's so hard to keep perspective when you're making these films and yeah. a little distance gets you away. And so there's, there's so much to say, but you, you rightly identify Joe's work and vision. I'm sure you recognize it from your film. You recognize his work from, uh, from the Kurt Cobain documentary yeah. uh, uh, that Brett Morgan made. It, 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 he's, um, he's very gifted. And uh, Judy, uh, we have a question here uh, from uh, someone watching. It says, it was mentioned that John's mother may have had bipolar disorder. Do you think John might have had it as well? Uh, I have bipolar two disorder and experience a significant boost in creativity and productivity during my hypomanic periods of bipolar. I wonder if something similar was happening with John. You know, I don't think it was bipolar because he didn't have tremendous highs and lows in general. But when he did cocaine, I do feel there was some chemical imbalance in him that made it do something a little different than in, in your brain than it did for the rest of us. I, yeah. It's just an instinct I have. I. You know. Do you think that he was medicating himself due to oh. depression or like that in, a, in an era like today where people handle those things uh, differently with antidepressants that it, it was a form of self-medication? Yeah, I do think it was a form of self-medication and maybe he had a little bit of a fatigue issue that was part of it too. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I do think it was self-medicating on some level. Um, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what, the, what he was lacking and looking yeah. for. If I knew things would probably be different. Because in the neighbor's section, they talked about that's when he went off the wagon when he had to shoot nights. And I think we, we've all had that experience where someone says, oh, for the next week or two weeks, you have to flip your schedule to eight at yeah. night or eight in the morning. And uh, certainly in an era where people thought cocaine was not dangerous. And, yeah. and in his conscious approach to that would be, yeah, I'll just do a little because it's night. Yeah, but, you know, for him it was always, and then I'll do a little more, and yeah, you know, the spin cycle as we used to call it. And uh, 
it, it says, uh, someone here was asking about younger viewers. How do you think younger viewers will respond to this film? And how do you think that John would have handled the, the political uh, correctness and comedy of today that people are, are worried about? Um, wait, what was the first question? <laughs> uh, just how, how young people, how do you hope young people will respond? Oh. Well, to I, the think that there, I think that the, the documentary gives a, a nice way to be introduced to John. It, it, it talks about his life pretty fully. And I, I, I have no problem with anything about his life. I think, you know, I've had problems with the way some people present things because I don't think they, you know, they might have the right facts, but it's not with any heart to it or understanding of the spirit, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like, uh, you know, they get to know who he is. I think that in terms of the political correctness, I mean, certainly, I mean, Animal House would not be made today. I yeah. think um, John actually was a, he was a woman's liver before I was. I mean, he actually, sometimes contrary to certain things you might hear, uh, was very good with women in general. He had that systemic sexism, but he was, a, he was aware of a lot of that and, and consciously tried to work around it. I mean, uh, so, you know, again, more when we were younger and then you get going and you're, you know, when we started living together, we went through the little push and pull on who's going to do what and you can't just leave your underwear on the floor and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the normal stuff. And uh, he was he was responsive uh, he, he, at Second City. He was the go-to guy to do scenes with the women. I mean, yeah. When he he worked really well with Gilda when they worked together at Lampoon. Um, in, in, it was, it, Saturday Night Live, something different took shape. Yeah, uh, but uh, well, that's such a well, competitive well, atmosphere there. It, it feels a couple like, things. Yeah. Uh, there are always you know, people seem to team up yeah. and work with so certain people. It was a country. boys' club, and the boys, you know. Were, yeah. You know, not horrible, but they were normally <laughs> that yeah. age then. Um, and of course with the comedy and, you know, it, it could get body or whatever, but, um, but they weren't, uh, it wasn't the level of things we've been hearing about of late that we're saying is, has to stop and can't, is just wrong. Yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, Animal House was borderline <laughs> in some of its aspect, but it is reflecting the, 60s so it wasn't even re reflecting the era in which it was made and um and in fact it was you know supposed to be an sort of an anti-fraternity movie really yeah and and yet fraternities embrace it a lot got turned around but uh it's uh yeah so he he would he would know how to go to the right comedy i don't yeah. think it would be troublesome for him and when you when you watch the movie uh Judy, is there anything uh, that you feel like, oh, I wish th they just knew this also? Like, is there something <laughs> that is the thing? Uh, I can't even imagine what it's like to, you know, we made a movie called Walk Hard, which was making fun of biopics of rock stars because right. it always seems impossible to get people's lives across. And when you know people intimately, and, you know, we all know that when we read an article about a friend and we're like, that's kind of not quite what that person's like. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's great that, that, that you're so happy with the movie, but it, yeah. does it leave anything on the table for you for like the experience? Yeah, but I feel, like, uh, I, I feel like it's all fine. I don't need to yeah. pinpoint. I, you know, I'm only going to draw attention to things that I think it's, yeah. it's good right now and let it be. Yeah, is it because <laughs> it's just, it. it's so intimate to you there's no way anyone would ever really yeah. understand yeah. your private world with him. You couldn't get it across. Yeah. Like asking yeah. Leslie. Exactly. I can't get you into Leslie my talking about me. <laughs> yeah, and, and also every, every filmmaker is gonna make a different uh, uh, yeah. a different film on the same yeah. subject, no matter the subject. I, I always say I could give you the same finite pile of raw material and the movie you made on that subject yeah. would be completely different than the movie I make. The difference being the difference between you and me, and yeah. uh, and or and as well as the experience we may have had collecting that material. So or our relationship to John, you know, uh, uh, as as or the subject. So it, it um, it's always going to be different, and no one in no case I think is that clearer than with the 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 people who know the subject best. Of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I made a film, the September issue about Anna Wintour. I promise you, she would have made a different movie. Yeah. If she was making it. <laughs> well, I was um, that she told me uh, in great detail. <laughs> the only the way I could do the Channeling documentary was because Gary was not around 
mm. because there was no aspect of it that, you know, I, I wasn't debating him uh, yeah. about it. And <laughs> sure, then ultimately, sure. you know, I've all, often thought like, well, this is just my interpretation as a friend of what I yeah. thought this was all about. And by the way, there's a chance I'm completely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you know, I'm guessing sure. as to the roots of his behavior. Uh, Judy, it did seem like uh, a, a big, uh, you know, motivator to his behavior and his journey was, you know, coming from the background of uh, hardworking immigrant parents and also parents that were working all the time and leaving him alone with his grandmother. Can you talk about those early years and, and, and how you think it shaped his drive to be successful in America? Yeah, when he was uh, six, they moved from Chicago to the suburb of Wheaton, um, kind of into at that point, it was almost far, the beginning of a subdivision in farmland. Um, so it became a very different life. And he was, uh, I think from the time they got there, I'm sure he was always, he, he was big on hanging out at other homes mm -hmm. and being out and playing. You know, he was always doing sports or band or chorus or, you know, he had all these activities that kept him uh, active and I think it was uh, partly because the home situation wasn't real comfortable in some level for him yeah and you know I think that's sort of the the emptiness and that he was always trying to fill um, that he didn't I'm possibly you know wrong but I think that is was that like a sense there. of abandonment for work or was it like tough I mean I know that a lot of immigrants were like physical with their kids or they were very tough on their kids. You know, what kind of environment was he in? Or I think was it, it was uh, that the, the father was absent most of the time. And when he was there, he's pretty, he was pretty quiet, pretty in, in, internal. Yeah. Um, and uh, it didn't understand the, you know, what was, how this country, you know, was so different from where he, from yeah. whence he came. Um, I mean, literally, you know, Albania is very poor and uh, they were mountain in the mountain and it, food could be a problem and all, and he came to the United States and, you know, made his way and built this different world. And uh, it was very different indeed. Uh, and then Agnes, his, his mom's, both her parents were from Albania. So she was very much in that culture, even though she was born here. And yeah, she was uh, emotionally up and down. I mean, she was, uh, um, her, her emotions were unstable. Um, yeah. So, you know, it just causes confusion, I think, to kids. And, yeah. uh, and makes you funny because you yeah. are trying to... She was very to... funny. I mean, she actually, yeah. I, I, Agnes was a, a real character <laughs> and, uh, and she was funny. And I, I, you know, I think a lot of people, they, they tend to want to make their parents happy. They want to make them laugh. Yeah. And so many people oh, we know are funny because they just wanted their parents to laugh and enjoy them and pay attention to them. And, and that was you know, big for John. That's, you know, that was his his best audience as a kid, you know, and, uh, and she certainly was, you know, proud of him. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was, there was just a, something not uh, right within the relationship that caused some kind of issue. Yeah. How, how is it for you reliving the, you know, those letters at the end when he's talking about yeah. his struggles, I was taken with how, um, eloquent he is about his struggle with addiction uh, you know he really can lay lay it out what what it feels like what he's trying to overcome uh well it's interesting because it is really laid out in those and i i, I think that's two letters i'm not 100 percent mm. certain on the end there but um it, it's actually kind of shocking to me because it wasn't that clear as we went through it yeah. And I think when I read that, I felt I, you know, I, I had such little information on addiction. Uh, he didn't seem addicted to me because he wasn't always using. He, he could walk away for months and years, yeah. a, a year. And I just, you know, felt it was like I, something he, he couldn't do. He needed to stop doing. He'd think he could do it a little. And sometimes that worked, but it just usually didn't. And yeah. Ignorance, you know, and naivety whatever uh so it's kind of shocking actually to to you know see that clearly subconsciously i was afraid and for him and um and i remember that so i wasn't uh totally ignorant of the the danger i yeah. it just still seemed pretty unreal i guess 
Was he writing you a lot of letters? Like, were there a lot of letters or there were just a few kind of no. key letters? No, no, I don't think there's much more by way of anything that like those end ones. Yeah. Uh, the, just letters in general, we had, I mean, most of our letter writing was during college years. Yeah. Um, what what were the, the happiest times, uh, you know, of all with, uh, you know, his success, like the pure joy moments where it was like, oh my God, the dream's coming true. This is, you know, the best, you know, when did uh, he appreciate it the most? Literally that idea of the success is coming true and this is the best was uh, uh, when um, the Blues Brothers played at Universal Amphitheater and I was standing behind them. So I saw them in silhouette with all the lights and, you know, huge crowd, which you don't really see, but you can tell they're up there. And just uh, the visual was so, you know, it was sort of like the opening of the uh, uh, Blues Brothers when the prison door opens and John's standing there in silhouette. Yeah. Yeah, and I just, my, you know, my heart just left from my chest and I just felt like they did it. I remember yeah. thinking just, they did it. Mm. This is a real band, you know, <laughs> this is like a great band. And, yeah. you know, <clears throat> um, but my, probably the, the time which was the most successful in terms of calling your own shots, being creative and, and all that was uh, during the radio hour. And actually that's, and that's when I, you know, John was the creative director and I was uh, the pro an associate producer. And, and, uh, and it was such a, a great, you know, group of people, Gilda Radner and Joe Flaherty, Brian Murray uh, and Harold Ramis were uh, with John, our stable actors. And then we hired other people to come in and work with them. And, you know, everybody was just writing. <laughs> yeah. Paul Schaefer was doing musical parodies. We it's would pure go. comedy. It's just so pure because there's no audience and you really feel like here's the funniest people ever yeah. completely focus on cracking each other up. And yeah. it's just, pure, it's maybe as pure as comedy gets. Mm. Given a studio on the floor from away from every, all the executives, yeah. you know, uh, we used to work most of the time we'd work really late because nobody would be in the building pretty much. And, uh, um, and then we, we, I mean, we went through a phase where we were going bowling after, we, uh, you know, we, we just, we go to a Schaefer had rented, I think, or Gilda, I guess, had rented Victor Garber's, uh, who was another Canadian actor, his apartment, and he had a piano, and, and we'd go there, and Paul would play, and everybody would sing, and it's just, it really was an innocent and fun time. Well, I, I would recommend to everybody out there to, to see this documentary, Belushi, on, on Showtime. It's fantastic. It, it really is a for a comedy fan, it's a it's a true gift. I, I couldn't have loved it more. Also, go to iTunes. They have the uh, National Lampoon uh, Radio oh. Hour on there. And it is so funny and really just timeless. There's some amazing stuff on there. If you want to hear uh, Christopher Guest doing James Taylor, huh. that's where you're going to get it. Oh, yeah. And uh, RJ, uh, you are working on the Billie Eilish documentary right now which uh, we're all very excited to, to see. When when does that arrive? Uh, in theaters and on Apple TV Plus in uh, February. Uh, wow, in February. So right on the heels. It, it coming around the corner. Uh, yep, well, that, gotta go. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, I'm sure that people are gonna love that. I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you uh, for talking to me. It was, uh, it was thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Judd. Thanks so much. And thank you, sweet. Judy. Thank you, RJ. See you again soon. Can't all wait. Right. Can't all wait. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye bye out there. Bye, Bye all. Take care. Thanks so much. Wear a mask. All right. See you guys. Bye. -bye.